Thank you so much, Mary. <clears throat> thank you, Mary, and, and thank you, Susan. It's a real honor to be here tonight. And um, I'll give a presentation and then happy to answer questions at the end. So I'm gonna do a, a screen share. And Susan, if you could just let me know, um, give me the thumbs up. Are you seeing my, my main screen here, not my speaker notes? Yes, I am. Wonderful, okay, great. Um, so tonight we're gonna talk about the Salish Sea, but before we dive into this ecosystem, this 16 or 17,000 square kilometer inland sea, I wanna step back a little bit. Tomorrow is World Ocean Day. I know you probably all have that on your calendar. This is where just at the beginning of the UN uh, decade of the ocean. And so I'm gonna take a step back to the Pacific Ocean, the largest of the oceans on earth. And you can see in the upper corner there, you see the Salish Sea. We're just a very small part of the whole global ocean. And when we think of the Salish Sea and we think about Lummi Island right here, Lummi Island, like the Salish is to the Pacific, is just one really small part of the entire uh, 17,000 square kilometer inland sea. It's a special place. It's a beautiful place. It's the center of your lives and what we're talking about tonight. Um, but I just want to kind of put you as a part of a small thing that's a bigger thing and part of a, even a bigger thing. And it just, I think it just helps our awareness. Um, I'll step back a little bit and take you really far away from Lummi Island. I'll take you back to the Appalachian Mountains. Um, I, my mom and my dad both were born in the Appalachian Mountains of West Virginia and Pennsylvania. And um, I was born a little white kid there. And so it's kind of how did this kid get from uh, the East Coast of the United States out here? And it's, it's a long story. I won't bore you with the whole thing. But, but basically, after I got out of vet school, I married this beautiful woman and we moved to Zimbabwe. And I, I worked for the Philadelphia Zoo when I was over there. I worked on lions and I worked on rhinoceros. And the plan was to have some kids and let them be feral and never have to buy shoes for them. Um, but sometimes life changes and takes different turns. And um, about 20 years ago, we found ourselves here on Orcas Island as, as your neighbor. And admittingly, at that time, I knew so little about the ocean, let alone the Sailor Sea. Um, the whole process was a real experience. I, I'm still not certain why they hired me. I'm su super glad that they did. Um, but, you know, when I moved in, I, I remember going on a beach walk and telling my wife, I, I saw all these different species of starfish. Those are all the same species. They just come in different colors, right? And I couldn't have told you that this was a long fin sculpt. And I, I couldn't even scuba dive when I first took this job. I wouldn't have told you which one is the coral and encrusting algae and which one is the juvenile dungeness crab. It's pretty obvious the orange one is the crab there. But I love this place. I love the interface between... Uh, rural places, you know, watching a green lean being eaten by a um, great blue heron to, to cityscapes and this interface that the whole area had between the ocean and people and cities and rural areas. And, and at that time, the Salish Sea was not even named, right? It wasn't until 2009 when the name was adopted by Washington and British Columbia and uh, in the United States and Canada in honor of the Coast Salish people that Mary just gave us a lovely introduction to. Um, and when we think of the ocean, Audrey would, would be uh, mad at me if I didn't tell you, things really start with the rocks, right? They start with the geology. I'm a biologist, Audrey is a geologist. The whole story starts with the rocks. And so when it comes to this area, basically just go to the beach and you'll see on the beach, every single different type of rock and color that's gonna tell you the the gothic tales of these cataclysmic fires uh, deep inside of the earth, the breakup of all of these old continents, the birth of new oceans, erupting volcanoes, rivers of glacial ice, and you know a new landscape that kind of came into this area. And it was really just about the last 1.8 million years, these series of events of glaciers growing in and then receding back that really shaped the final touches of this place. These kind of ice sculpted, you know, cirque basins, the valleys, the fjords, the topography. And when we talk about the Salish, we, and I'm gonna get into that a little bit more, but we're really talking about the connection from the top of the mountains to the bottom of the ocean. And it's the geology 
that shapes all of that, right? It's the rocks that are on the shoreline that provide the stability for something like this gooseneck barnacle, or it's the rocks at the base of the ocean that provide the habitat for this jeweled top snail and these orange cup corals. Joe, um, I'm, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. We can see, uh, you're not in presentation mode. It's a, just a different version of speaker, of, of speaker mode. Sorry about that. Well, tell me more about that. So let me just uh, come out of that for a second. And so you're not seeing my slides. We're seeing your slides, but they, the next one is to the position to the right. So the way we had done it before. Oh, yeah, you're seeing it in the speaker mode. So let's yeah. do this. Um, let's just do this. And is that getting better for you? Um, I don't see your screen. All right, let's do this then. <clears throat> and we'll go from there. And I don't mind if you see the the notes, but it's better if you don't. We can, uh, there we go. All is right. Is that better for you? This is what live TV used to be like, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it was live TV that was like this. And so anyway, I'm glad you're at least seeing the images along the way because they are beautiful and I don't mind that you're seeing the new slides coming up. But, um, and so basically what I want to do is I kind of want to start, start, you know, talk about the geology, but now I want to back up from the ocean into, into the mountains and into the forest. And a lot of times we have this somewhat arbitrary distinction between land and sea, uh, but I want to convince you that that interface is not as clear as we think it is. And in fact, it's the land and the, and the rainwater and the freshwater that really make this place so special. And so all of the water that's coming from the mountains that surround all of us, the forest, is really what provides this place, uh, the water, the freshwater that makes this the estuary. And so, uh, and if you kind of think about that connection, salmon are definitely the best example for us to use. You know, it's the, it's the food of the Coast Salish people. Where we live in the, in the Salish Sea is the southernmost latitude that we can still find all five species of native Pacific salmon. In addition to that, we have steelhead, which are sea run rainbow trout. We have uh, sea run cutthroat trout, and then we have bull trout that actually come out into the marine water as well. And the, you know, if you think of that and the role that the salmon play, these salmon are born in the furthest reaches of these streams. They go out sometimes as far as Alaska, out into the Pacific Ocean, and then come back bringing those marine derived nutrients back into the region and, and then feeding 138 different vertebrate species, right? And so these include things like the, you know, bald eagles, they include things like bears, they include species we don't think about, like this American dipper. American dippers never go to the ocean, right? They don't have a beach towel, they don't have a beach umbrella. They make their living in rivers and streams, diving underwater, eating uh, aquatic insects, and they're also eating salmon eggs, which is a big important part of their diet. So they're eating nutrients that have come from in the center of that Pacific Ocean and brought all the way maybe back up that Nooksack River uh, close to where you live to feed them. Another example are marble merlets. These are penguin-like birds of the Northern Hemisphere that can dive underwater using their wings um, to kind of fly underwater. Um, diving to depths of 45 or 50 feet deep. But where do they nest? They nest in old growth forests. And so every morning they're leaving their nest, they're going out, they're catching forage fish and then bringing it back. And then you just have to step away to the, uh, to the satellite view to really see what's going on here. And what you're seeing, this kind of beautiful turquoise green hue is the freshet uh, coming down from the Fraser River. And it's so profound. It, it's pumping out as the snow is starting to melt now, this type of year, uh, this time of year, and pretty soon, putting out 2.6 million gallons of water a second into the Strait of Georgia. And, and that water, remember, is more buoyant. The fresh water is more buoyant than the seawater. And so you can see it to the right here of the bow of this boat. Um, and that Fresh water can be six to 33 feet deep. It comes out, it's very, very oxygen rich. It mixes with the water that's coming from the ocean, open ocean, that's very nutrient rich, but oxygen poor. Hits the Gulf Islands, it hits the San Juan Islands, that turn, acts like a big egg beater, mixes it all up, 
add in the sunlight, and then you get the phytoplankton and the zooplankton that form the foundation of the ocean uh, that lives around us. And so you see all different types of plankton. And I think, you know, the mistake I made when I first moved here, it's cold, it's dark, and you don't expect colors, you don't expect beautiful things, you expect hues of brown. But really, you know, Mary will know this as a scuba diver, but every color you can imagine that you can find on a tropical coral reef, you can find in the Salish Sea. You just occasionally have to bring some light with you to be able to see that. And there are all these relationships. So we have probably over 6,000 different invertebrates. And the beauty of that is that that's kind of a number or, or species richness, but the biodiversity comes from all of the interactions of those species. And so, you know, this is a great one. You can kind of dive down and on the tentacles of that anemone, you see the black and white sea fleas there. Similar sort of a thing. You're looking at this crimson anemone and you kind of dive down. And what do you see is this beautiful uh, shrimp, this candy striped shrimp uh, that's just gorgeous. Candy striped because it's just so sweet. And just like the anemone Nemo, uh, the fish living, the clownfish living with the anemone in the Disney movie, you know, there's a symbiotic relationship that's going on here. That beautiful candy striped shrimp is taking care of the crimson anemone. It's keeping other shrimp away that would attack the anemone. The anemone is protecting the shrimp from being eaten by fish because the anemone has stinging cells. And then it, the, the shrimp is benefiting from material that are not completely ingested into the anemone. So all of these relationships are happening, uh, some of them symbiotic, some of them predator prey. And this is when a lot of people look at this and they think, this is really predator prey. You know, we're, we're kind of trained to think of a falcon coming down and taking a Western sandpiper off the beach or Thompson's gazelle being taken down by a cheetah. But, you know, what's happening here is this leather star is approaching to eat this anemone, right? And I'll just give you a little video here and narrate it. And so the anemone is not going to just take this. It builds itself up, reaches over and, you know, with its tentacles, stings that and then pulls away, right? Must get away. Now, if that sea star had a head, it's be saying, gosh, I've got a headache. And the an anemone doesn't have any eyes. So it's thinking like, got to get away from that starfish, right? Actually doesn't get very far away, but that's okay. It's, you know, it's getting out of the, the prey position. And just when you think you've seen everything that copper rockfish comes into view to remind you that there's always something more to see or to learn about. And just like all of these different interactions, all of these different colors. Another one, another type of interaction that we see is this mimicry. And so you're looking at the world's largest barnacle, a giant barnacle that we have here, surrounded by all of these strawberry anemones. And coming out are the cirri or the feet or fingers of that barnacle that are coming out to catch plankton to feed that barnacle. And then when you look at that, so when that barnacle dies, there are certain fish that will go in and hide in that barnacle ones like this grunt sculpin. And if you look at the pectoral fins or the tail fins of that grunt sculpin, they're shaped just like the cirri of the barnacle, right? All of these things have evolved together to make this really beautiful, complex relationship. And, and what, that's really what makes this place unique. Now, we wanna learn the names of everything. We wanna know who our neighbors are and who we live with. But sometimes I'm thinking, you know, step back just a little bit, right? That sure, that's a northern kelp crab. That's probably a western gall, glaucuswing gall hybrid. But like, sometimes it's better to just look at the image and see what you're thinking, you know? That gall is gonna eat that crab, right? That crab knows that. And what's that crab doing? It's got one little pincher. It's reaching up to that gall saying, come on, you know, I'm gonna give you everything I got. And look what it's doing with its other hand. It's it doesn't have fingers, but if it did, it'd be giving in the middle one and be like giving the bird the bird right there, right? And so these are all the interactions that make this place so beautiful. And when you're looking at these animals, you learn about them. You learn that this gull is a generalist. It will generally eat anything it can put into its mouth and even some things it can't fit into its mouth, right? Other birds, you know, we have 172 different species of birds that use the Salish Sea. Ones like this rhinoceros oclet is a specialist. It specializes 
in diving underwater like that marbled merlet I talked about that nests in the old growth forest, flying underwater with its wings and catching small forage fish like the sand lance you see here. And it's beautiful because not only does it catch one, it can come up and take a breath, go down, catch another one without losing the first one because they have little tiny barbs on the inside of their bill and their mouth that allow them to hold on to that fish, open up their mouth and catch another one. And so all of these things are happening simultaneously, right? So think about this image here. You've got the rhinoceros oclets, you've got the common mers, they're diving. Common mers are diving almost 500 feet deep. They're bringing those fish into a bait ball. They're pushing it up to the surface. The gulls are coming in. They can plunge dive maybe a foot or so to grab some stuff. And then you have a humpback whale coming in, you know, 80,000 pounds of animal taking the whole ball of fish and then it all the cycle goes over and over again right and and when you look the nuances the beauty of the stuff that's happening even these fish themselves right these sand lands they don't have a swim bladder and so when there's not plankton for them to convert into fat and feed all these other uh, fish and birds and mammals they dive into the sand and hide out in the sand as a safety area, right? I'm gonna show you an image that was taken from a submarine that we brought out into the San Juans a few years ago. I want you to look at the right end of the screen and you see that fish just coming in and diving. I'm gonna do it one more time. So you see it's coming in the top right corner. It's just going into the sand wave and, and it just hides itself in there. And, and these sand lance are one of probably just about 11 or 12 different forage fish that we have. Here's another fish. Some of you may recognize it. Many of you probably won't. This is called a spotted ratfish. It kind of looks, it's a chimera. It looks like a couple different creatures tamed together. It's beautiful, has no economic value whatsoever, only gets to about two feet long. And, but if you took all of the fish in the Salish Sea and bend them up by species and weighed them, the highest biomass, the highest mass of all of the fish would be ratfish a fish that we really don't know that much about, right? And we have giant fish. We don't think of this place as a place of sharks, but we are home and have been home to basking sharks. This is the second largest fish in the world next to a whale shark. They can grow to 30 feet long. They're specialized. They don't have teeth. They're not like a great white that's gonna pull you off your surfboard or something like that. Basically, they're, they're opening their mouth, they're basking at the surface, they're taking water through their gills at a rate, something crazy of 132,000 gallons of water an hour. And those gill rakers are taking out little tiny plankton, copepods and other zooplankton that feed them. And they were once so common in this area that they were a nuisance to people who were fishing for salmon. And so Fisheries and Oceans Canada actually created a program to try and annihilate them, to get rid of them. Super sad, a really fascinating book was written by Scott Wallace and Brian Gisborne on this. Um, and, but the beauty is that these fish are starting to come back. And so the only thing crazier than this fish is, is Florian Grando, the guy who took this picture. And I said, Florian, this was taken off of the west side of San Juan in 2009. I said, you were on that boat by yourself. How did you know you could dive off that boat, the current was going, and get video and photographs of this whale shark, and, or of this basking shark? And he said, I'm not stupid, Joe. I tied a rope to my foot, I tied it to the boat, and then I jumped overboard. And I said, well, I, I guess your mom would be proud of that flooring, right? So big fish, little fish. And definitely the award for the cutest little fish in my mind goes to the Pacific spiny lump sucker. There's a lot of lump suckers in the world, literally and figuratively. And this is one that we have. The Latin name describes it as a cute little sphere, a little orb. And um, it doesn't swim well, very tiny little fins, but it has a beautiful suction cup, modified, highly modified pelvic fins that allow it to suck down. And so when you see this thing, this, this fish, uh, happening. Let me see if I can get this to play for you here. Um, so there you go. So you see him. So here he comes down. A little bit of current sucks down, right? And that, that gunnel is over there looking at him like, 
what is going on? You call yourself a fish? And the little guy's like, hey, you better hold on. We've got some current coming here, right? And so all of these different creatures, I mean, each one of these animals, you could make almost an entire Disney film out of these animals. And then we also have a lot of species that depend on the Salish, but they don't spend their entire lives here, okay? As Audrey wrote in the book, she, she and it's so beautiful, she said, species that make epic journeys that stitch continents together with the feathering of a million wings. And basically, this is almost a stone's throw from where you live. Uh, this is just up at the Delta Port. And at the Delta Port, a really fascinating thing happens. The fresh water that's coming out of the Fraser River are bringing diatoms. And those diatoms combined with these little tiny plankton diatoms from the ocean make sort of a biofilm. And many species like the Dunlin, Western Sandpiper, they stop over on their migration, some of them 9,000 kilometers going from Peru to Alaska to feed on not just the in, uh, invertebrates that are in that mud, but also on these little tiny biofilm made up of diatoms. So a really important area for over 30 species of migratory birds that pass through here. And then we have birds like the snowy owl that don't even come here every year but just periodically after they've had big, you know, huge lemming years up north and then there's not food, then they'll come down and they'll be hunting in places like Boundary Bay, Skagit Bay, Padilla Bay, places that are in your backyard, spending the winter before they migrate back north. And then mammals, we probably have 38 different mammals that use the area. This is a, a American mink. I've studied mink before, I've worked on mink, I've been bitten by mink. I never would have thought that the mink would do belly flops when they enter the water, but thank goodness for Phil Green, who was you know, patient enough to realize that he might see something that he didn't expect, right? And many of these species, like this stellar sea lion, many of the mammals that make their living in the Salish make it underwater, but still have to breathe air. And so there's just fascinating stories, you know, how does, a, a, how does a harbor seal that can dive 1,600 feet deep fish when all of the light disappears after 1,000 feet deep? Well, it's using its whiskers. It's basically hunting by braille under the water, right? And then, of course, we've heard about the killer whales. This is a fish-eating southern resident killer whale. We have, nor we have northern residents also in the Salish Sea. We have a different ecotype. We have the bigs or the transient killer whales that eat mammals. And, and these animals, their teeth are impressive. It's like a Tyrannosaurus rex, right? You can see the interlocking teeth on this, from this skull. And then we have a third ecotype that a lot of people don't know about the offshore. We always wondered why their teeth would be worn down to the gum, but it turns out that um, some work by John Ford and others at Fisheries and Oceans Canada shows that they're actually shark specialists. They make their living out of eating sharks and shark skin, they have these placoid denticles. It's like sandpaper. Actually, shark skin was the first sandpaper before modern technology made the type of sandpaper that we use today. And <clears throat> you know, it's, it's important for us to remember that no matter what ecotype of killer whale we're talking about or other cetacean that we have, that everything that we do actually affects all of these animals, right? So we know that the killer whales, southern resident killer whales and other uh, killer whale ecotypes in the area, you know, they, they are not visual animals. They're acoustic animals, right? They live in a world of a blind person, maybe like Stevie Wonder, right? They are listening, they're communicating together, they're using echolocation. And our vessel traffic, us being on the water, that noise actually reduces their ability to echolocate and find scarce fish and also reduces their ability to communicate with each other. They do the same thing that you or I would do at a loud cocktail party. They speak slower and hold their syllables longer, right? Just because that noise. And just a, a paper that came out by Rob Williams and some others about a year ago looked at the interface between underwater noise and the US and the Canadian Endangered Species Act. And so the 
got together a group of lawyers and a group of biologists specializing in acoustics. And they think probably at this point, we have enough noise underwater in the Salish Sea that we should be thinking about it at, like we do pollution, right? Where that level has reached a point where it's negatively impacting and probably not just whales. We know that it can impact fish. And there have been recent studies coming out showing that underwater noise can even impact invertebrates. And so it's something that we're just being aware of that we really need to be paying better attention to. Just like the killer whales, just like the birds, just like everything, we may exploit them differently, but we also depend on these food resources, right? These gooey ducks that are being harvested commercially here. Our lives depend on the biological productivity of the Salish Sea. Even though we can get food from other parts of the world and things like that, we are connected to where we live. And this is a picture from your neighbor's Lummi Island Wild that's using reef nets to catch uh, seafood in this area. The, many of you may be part of their buyer's club. But our, our dependency and our relationship is really not just about extraction, right? Even non-consumptive users of the Salish Sea are important. You know, scuba does, this is a scuba diving mecca. And the, we did a study a little while ago showing that cold water scuba diving has a multi-million dollar economic impact on the Salish Sea. And it takes money from places like cities into rural areas as well. And so it's a tourist drive that benefits us economically. Just people wanting to go and see what we have, right? And, and I think when I think about this place, I like this picture that Wendy Chattel took a lot because First thing you notice, I notice in there is I notice that there are trees, right? This is taken at the mouth of the Jordan River um, on Vancouver Island, just at the mouth of the Salish Sea. And so it reminds us about the connection between the ocean and between land. And it reminds us about the interdependency and, and those marriage lines that aren't really there. Um, and then the other thing you realize is people are making money off of trees. They're harvesting trees. And the Salish does provide an economic incentive. And then you see other people out there that are kayaking and people that are surfing, and then you see them doing it all at the same time. And what it reminds us is that there are a lot of resources here. And if we can find ways to share them and respect the use that others have of them, it's gonna be a better place, right? We're gonna be able to make this place work for all of us and take care of this place. And so you, you go to places like New York, you think of the skyline, you go to places like Vancouver or Seattle, you think of the shoreline, right? That's what defines us. It's the Salish Sea, that view of the Salish Sea, the fish and, and other things that invertebrates that come from the ocean that feed these people. That's what makes us who we are in this area is our connection to this magnificent inland sea. And we, and we do have an obligation. We we have an obligation to enjoy it and an obligation to take care of it. I'll talk about that in a little bit more. But this picture here, <clears throat> this was taken by Les Basso at the Vancouver Sun. Um, and I, I put this picture up one time and I was talking about how these people were protesting the expansion of the Kinder Morgan pipeline. And Slay Tooth Chief Maureen Thomas pulled me aside afterwards. She said, Joe, we were not just there protesting. This is Slay Tooth, Squamish, Musqueam actually multiple First Nations that are together in this image. She said, we weren't just protesting, we were protecting. We're protecting our culture, our resources, and those are the same resources and overlap of that culture that goes with you as well. And I think that's something that's profound for us to consider and to think about. And you know, when, when we started putting this together, we always think, well, what, what is a healthy ecosystem? What does that ecosystem look like? What does that mean to us? How will we know when we reach that? And, and our vision for this place is really that we live in a place where we know and we recognize our living marine resources better than we know our corporate logos. And we watch and we monitor the ecosystem better than we watch and monitor the weather or the NASDAQ or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And we work to restore it and protect it as if our lives and our livelihoods depend on it, because really they do. And like I said earlier, you know, this quote by E.B. White, I rise in the morning torn between the desire to save the world 
and a desire to savor the world. And that makes it hard to plan the day for sure. But the take home message there is we actually probably have an obligation to do both, to live in such a beautiful place and to not experience it and to not appreciate it would be a crime, but also to not take care of it would be the crime as well. So we really probably owe the Salish a little bit of both in our time with that. Now let's think about this place. I put this map up a little bit earlier and many of you have looked at the book. You've lived on Lummi Island. You've lived in the Salish Sea. You recognize the Coast Salish tribes. We asked ourselves a few years back, we said, how many people know the Salish Sea? Because it's hard to take care of a place if you don't know what it's called, right? And I think you might be surprised. We just published this paper last year, but the, the the survey was done several years ago. Only 5% of people in Washington state know the name Salish Sea. And it's not much better. It is a little bit better in British Columbia, 14%. And so that reminds us that even though we know and our friends know, we do run in circles of like-minded people and not everybody knows. And what that means when you don't know about a place, then you don't aren't getting connected to it then you're not reaching out to protect it. And that influences the way that, that not just us, but the way that everybody treats this place and that affects the result of this place. Remember I talked earlier about knowing and recognizing things better than our corporate logos. And I think right now you're all probably, even though it doesn't say it anywhere in that picture, you're thinking, oh, Seattle Seahawks, right? Well, the Seattle Seahawks are clearly better known than the Salish Sea, right? But the, the Salish Sea provides us much, much more, right? We need people to be aware of this area and to advocate for it. And, and just like the Seahawks do a lot for us as a society, the Salish does even more, right? It provides us food, it provides us weather, it provides us our, our, you know, our culture and who we are. The economy will take care of the Seahawks it will not take care of the Salish Sea without a group of people who are advocating and taking, for, taking care of it. And so the program I work for, the Sea Doc Society, we're a science-based conservation group. But we recognize that all the science in the world, all that knowledge is not gonna help us if we don't get it out to people that can use that in their day-to-day -day decisions, in their voting decisions and things like that. And that's really why we put this book out a few years ago, uh, Sailor Sea Jewel of Pacific Northwest. That's, that's really why we put out a kid's book. You know, people came to us and said, hey, what about the kids? Turns out that fifth graders, and some of you may be fifth grade teachers, that's when they learn about ecosystems. That's when they learn about trophic levels. That's when they learn about all of these things. But unfortunately, a lot of those things that they learn, they're getting examples from the Serengeti or examples from the Amazon. They're not getting examples from the Salish Sea in places where they live. And so we actually created uh, a, an entire free curriculum, fifth grade science curriculum on the Salish Sea. And, uh, and that's available online. We have a junior sea doctors site. We've been training teachers to use that. The other thing that we thought about when this kid's book came out, we were, we were reminded that when you have problems with an ecosystem, when that food becomes contaminated or that water becomes unswimmable, a certain group of people, usually the people that are disadvantaged are disproportionately affected. People that don't read English, people that don't understand the signs, people that can't go and buy clams that were harvested in Alaska, right? And we didn't really want this kid's book to just be available to kids whose parents could afford $20. And so when the kids book came out a couple of years ago, we actually had a campaign where people made an investment. You could buy a book for a kid who couldn't afford a book. And so tens of thousands of dollars worth of books later, we've been giving these books out to Tribal Connect and Title I schools. And this is a quote from a woman at um, Western Washington University who was running a program, Salmon in the Skagit, for farm workers' kids. And I think we gave her 105 books or something like that. And she said, I can't even tell you how exciting this is. It's a great teaching book. And then the students who have so few books in their homes already, some of them who live within 10 miles of the Salish, 
their entire lives, but have never been to the beach. That made me really happy that, you know, not only were we getting kids excited about the Sailor Sea, but also about reading and about taking those books home to their family. And I, I went to visit them not long after we gave them these books at the summer school that they had. And the, the highlight of my day was at the end of the day, I was walking around signing books, talking to kids about the, what they were doing. And there was a young girl, fifth grader, who was working on the computer. And I said, hey, tell me what you're working on. She said, well, I'm doing a little project to see if chemicals that we use in the fields can affect salmon. I said, oh, that sounds very important. I said, well, do they? And she looked at me with the rolled eyes that only a fifth grade girl, and as a father of three girls, I can tell you this, she said, duh, of course. And I thought, how beautiful is that, right? She comes from a family that does farm worker stuff, and she is recognizing the relationship and the interconnectedness of all of the stuff that goes on there. And that's also why we put together, as Mary said before, the Sailor Sea Wild, which is a YouTube video series. Um, you can just Google Sailor Sea Wild, and these are all for free, kind of directed at kids, but designed to be informative and fun. And we just actually dropped a new one today on bald eagles, and you can see me get bit by a bald eagle on that. Uh, Justin Cox put together a pod of Orcas podcast. So if you like listening to podcasts, you can get that wherever you get your podcasts. The first season was all about Orcas, but the new season is actually coming up and expanding about that. And so many ways that you can connect to the stuff that we're doing. There's a lot of overlap with the sorts of things that you're interested um, with as well. And so I just want to say thank you. And then I think what I can do is stop the screen share and maybe we can open this up to some, some Q&A and some discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was a wonderful uh, presentation and your pictures are great. Thank you, Susan. Um, yeah. I wonder if there are any um, questions in the audience that people might want to put into the chat. Um, I have one that I was thinking about as I was looking at all of those beautiful things. Sure. What, what do you feel like um, are a few things that individuals can do who live in a place like, like we do to help protect some of those beautiful places? Yeah, and so, you know, when I think about a question like that, there's things that we can do that um, if everybody did would be better. And then there's a lot of times there's an opportunity for us to say like, oh, if we all planted a tree, that would definitely go a long way towards dealing with with carbon in the atmosphere and reduction of carbon. And, and a lot of people will say that, they'll say like, Joe, that's not what we need to do. We need to stop the biggest polluters. We need to change away from our economy. Yeah, we need to do that. But right now, just north of where you live, uh, Denman Island, Hornby Island, you know, very small land trust up there is planting thousands and thousands of trees because they recognize, hey, we got a role to play to reduce carbon. And, you know, if everybody on earth planted six trees a year, we could actually take care of some of the global issues associated with climate change. So there are small things to do like planting trees that I think are very easy to do. Um, if you all planted six trees each on Lummi Island and nobody else did anything, would that help? No, but we got to start somewhere on that kind of stuff. So I think, you know, addressing climate change is probably one of the largest threats that we face to, <clears throat> to the Salish Sea right now. The other thing that we can think a lot about is, you know, do you vote? How do you vote? Who do you talk to about where you vote? We had a very big push last legislative session to try and uh, enact some laws that protected riparian habitat. These are the trees, the bushes, the plants that grow along rivers rivers like the Nooksack, rivers like the Skagit. And, um, and we needed to do that because to protect salmon, to decrease temperatures in those streams was really important to protect contaminants from going into the streams. And, and that really didn't get through because um, people said, I don't wanna lose farmland to do that. And, and so we, we definitely don't wanna be losing farmland to things like housing and stuff like that when we can do infill. But, protecting our streams and shoreline, I think that's critical for our long-term uh, ability to have salmon and have 138 different species that protect it. So, you know, people need to pay attention to those sorts of things that are going on. 
and and be able to reach feel comfortable reaching out so you know asking the question you're asking and then doing everything that you can do would be my answer susan that's a very good answer um i got a couple of comments saying that the talk was wonderful and it was Thank great you. Um, and then I had another question um, from Sarah, who says that uh, this last week I was out at Nia Bay and discovered two octopuses trapped in a tide pool with a minus tide. They were amazing to watch in their attempt to find deeper water. Who knew they'd travel out of the water? Should I have assisted them or remain a witness as I did? Yeah, really good question, Sarah. Like, when do we actually participate in what's going on? And it sounds like what you did worked out well because you got to see that Hey, they're not afraid to move over land to get to a place. You know, they're they're not safe because they can be eaten by an eagle or, or something else at that time. Um, and then I would say, you know, when you're comfortable, I think that it's okay to make an assistance. I feel confident about intervening and assisting when it's something that we've done. And so in the case, and I didn't show these slides because sometimes they're gruesome, but, you know, we have a lot of sea lions that are entangled in plastic packing straps. It's very clear that that is a problem that we created. And it's not an issue from a population level because we have a lot of sea lions, but it is an animal welfare issue that we've caused that problem because that's our plastic out there. And we probably owe it to those sentient animals who are as smart, if not smarter than our dogs that we love so much to get that off of them. And so I think, you know, in cases where you think that we've caused the problem, I think it's worthwhile intervening Never do anything that you don't think is safe, obviously. Um, are there certain things that uh, come from humans that you see show up a lot in animals like that? Like uh, I know I came from Michigan and we were all told to clip those little plastic six packs because mm -hmm. they got found around a lot of the local birds. Are there other things like that that we should be thinking about? Well, it's interesting. We do see a lot of trash in animals. You know, we had a gray whale a couple of years ago that Cascadia Research Collective necropsy. I mean, it had sweatpants in it. It had bags in it and things like that. You know, a lot of times stuff enters the ocean and we don't see it anymore, it kind of mysteriously disappears. But that stuff, you know, does end up on the bottom of the ocean. Animals like gray whales that, you know, uh, feed along the bottom do pick that stuff up. I think our beaches are a lot cleaner than they used to be. And so I think that that's an encouraging and that's a sign that people are paying more attention. But, you know, it's just it's a, the general stuff that goes in there. As, as scientists, we're always learning new things. You know, wasn't long ago we learned that the copper from our metal brake pads was responsible for big salmon mortalities in urban areas like Seattle, urban streams. And unfortunately, people are switching now um, across the nation to ceramic brake pads. And so that's brilliant. Just last year, we realized that there was a compound from our tires that changes components after it's been run on a tire, and that actually can, can, can kill salmon. And so we don't have a solution to that yet. And so, you know, everything, I always think like everything we do on land either hurts or harms or hurts or helps things that we can do on the ocean. And we have bigger buffer zones that's helping reduce contaminants that get in. We cut down more trees and have less, that's harming the things there. So, you know, just thinking about our interactions, I think is really important. Um, I was also curious, I know you said that there was a prize for the cutest fish. Um, do you have a, a particularly favorite marine creature? That is a good question. So I'm super lucky, uh, Susan, that I work on a lot of different animals, right? I can work on sea lions or mink or river otters or eagles and the, and for me, it's kind of weird, but like whatever I'm working on, I am so into that right at that point. Um, I, but I would lie to you if I, I love octopus. I think they're so fascinating and so different than all of us. Um, and, but I also like killer whales, you know, and next week we'll be going out to do some research there and just, I'm just, I think I'm like an ADD fifth grader. I'm just like, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that, you know? Um, are, are there any uh, like questions you have for us 
as a as a group of people who live here who really care about all of these issues yeah I, I would like to, so i read a book recently called hope matters and and it was really powerful for me because a lot of times when with the work that i do some days i'm very inspired because we're making positive change other days i'm very frustrated because i feel like we're not doing enough we're like the red queen just running to stay in place or whatever so I, I, I would be curious to know that as a group who cares and is interested and lives so close to the sailor sea you know do you feel hopeful and optimistic that you can do stuff to make the place better i don't know if anybody has comments on that or yeah, not i'd be interested in hearing that too um, but while we wait for those for those to come in i did have another question about when will the new episodes of the pot of work has come out yeah, so Justin just did one, and I don't know if I'm supposed to tell anybody, I'm going to tell all of you anyway. He actually interviewed the woman who wrote that book, Hope Matters. He was so happy when he got off the phone and after that podcast with her. And so I think he's editing now, and, and I'd be surprised if it didn't come at the latest early July, but sometime this month will be coming out. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're getting some answers now. Um, people yeah. say, uh, yes, I pick up garbage along any beach or road I walk along. I wish everyone felt that their minor addition helps to add up something, to add up to something greater. Yeah. Thank you to who, whomever said that, because I think that, you know, we can be negatively influenced by other people, but a lot of times when somebody sees you picking up trash, they're yeah. like, yeah, actually, we need to take care of this place. And, and I think that that influences our heart and everything else that we do. When we see ourselves as caretakers or stewards, we think about it differently than just consumers or users. And so just, you know, people seeing you do that reminds them of to check their relationship with the place where we live as well. Uh, one other question that we had was, um, I work with the Heritage Trust to educate others about marine debris prevention. Mary Ross said that. Um, and then also that uh, Elizabeth says, we have to have hope and joy because it costs us much more not to. Don't underestimate the impact we can have. We can each have to eat, sorry. It, Estimate the impact we can each make to ourselves, our families, or our communities. Oops, I guess that was Don who was using yeah. that link. <laughs> no, really, really important, Don. One time, there's a guy that I like. He's a great writer named Carl Safina, and he's wrote a song for the Blue Ocean and a book about albatross, written a bunch of really beautiful books. And I was talking with him one time. He was out here visiting, and I was talking about the work that we did. And I said, you know, we're just doing everything that we can see ourselves doing to make a difference. And I said, but Carl, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes um, you feel like you could lose hope. I said, and you don't want to lose hope because, and I just thought about it. I didn't know what to say, but he's really poetic. He goes, because then you're hopeless and nobody wants to be hopeless. And I was like, bam, that is it, Carl. Nobody wants to be hopeless. Yeah, there are a lot of comments coming through that I feel that same, same yeah. sentiment. Um, I, you may know that the Lummi Island Heritage Trust and community volunteers just planted 400 trees. That's warmed my heart right there. Yeah, and they're and, thriving. And, they're they're beautiful. And those trees will be, you know, growing for hundreds of years is the beauty too. So yeah. I, I love that. I did not yeah. know that. Yeah. Made my night. <laughs> and then we also have a question. Um, how would you recommend someone get started toward a career in wildlife conservation? Yeah, and so um, I get that a lot. Um, and I asked that to a lot of people when I was growing up and when I was a kid too. The thing that I think is important to remember, I'm, I'm a scientist because um, I was just like a nerd as a kid and a geek and that, and I love information and I love analysis and I love data. Just as important though, science is no good if we don't communicate it. And we, you know, people like, Justin Cox, who can do a podcast, people like Bob Friel, who can pull together Sailor Sea Wild, people like Carl Safina, who can write a book. You know, we all have different skill sets. And so, you know, just because I'm a scientist doesn't mean you should be a scientist. You should be whatever your skill set and your, your joy level dictates. And so, you know, find what your gift is and then use that for the thing that you're passionate about, I think is really the way to do that. 
If you want to be a lawyer, be a lawyer that advocates for you know climate change and and things like that. You know that use use that skill set for for what you're interested in. Yeah. There were a few other uh, messages that came through, just also uh, answering your question. Um, seeing volunteers that span an age range from toddlers to seniors working together to plant trees really gave me hope for the future, says Mia. I love that. Yeah, I do too. And uh, Faith says, I have to have hope. I love nature too much to throw up my hands and give up. Right, right. It's yeah. there. It's resilient. You know, we just we just have to be backing it up and doing what we can to push it in the right direction. And there's also a question from Leslie asking if it's possible to visit the Sea Dock location on Orcas Island. Yeah, so we are we have a small office in West Sound on Orcas Island. It's not much to see. We we have two boats <laughs> that are in the dock in front of the office. We have lab space at Friday Harbor Labs, and so you know we're we're a bunch of science geeks in you know in there with computers and dive tanks in the closet and things like that. But if you're ever on Orcas Island, please do call us. And we, we love to have people stop in. Um, and I'm also just getting a lot of messages saying um, that your talk was really inspiring and thanking you for, for being so inspiring. And I wanna make sure to relay that too. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that. And thanks for having me. Yeah. I'm always inspired to talk to a group like yours because you know knowing that people are out there doing good stuff, um, pushing the you know conservation forward, that makes my day. Well, you certainly gave us some beautiful visual images to make that effort oh, concrete. I have to thank all of those <laughs> photographers. You know, when yeah. we there were 55 different photographers in the first book. I can't remember how many in the second. We looked at about 6,000 different images for that first book. And it's just so rich. There were so many images when we went back to do the kids' book a few years later. We actually had a photo contest because we said, if there's all these powerful images every year, like we've got to find a way to share them. So we had a Sailor Sea in Focus photo contest uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm getting a lot of messages coming in saying that your enthusiasm is contagious, um, that you're inspiring. Um, <laughs> is there any way that we can see that charming video of the hopping sea urchin again? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can, it's all just right there on YouTube. That's the beauty Excellent. of that. That stuff cool. is available for educating and exciting people. Yeah. Well, is it okay? Can we, can we post that on our social oh, yeah, media? You can post I'd that love on, to yeah. share that. that that's, yeah. a, that's a great video. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. I'm, I'm still seeing more thank yous. I'm not seeing um, a lot of more questions come okay. in. So if you have questions, maybe zip them off right now and, um, Meantime, just this is such a wonderful presentation. Yeah. We're so, so happy to have you. Really nice to connect with all of you. It's been a while since I've been to Lummi Island. Uh, my, my wife does affordable housing. And so sometimes she's over in that area, but I think it's probably been 10 years since I've been to Lummi Island. So, oh, well, we should change that. <laughs> yeah, next time we'll hopefully things will be better. We'll make it in person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank you again. And, um, Everybody's now saying, we'd really yeah. love to host you. <laughs> awesome. Um, and yes, uh, Faith, we will um, put this recording up on our website and absolutely uh, you can share it with other people. That'd be great. Um, and we would That'd love to do that just to spread this message. Thank so, you. Thank you. Uh, we were delighted to have you and thank you everybody who joined us. Yeah, really, really a joy. So I look yeah. forward to being in touch with all of you. Thank you so much. Take care.